Thank you. 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 Th
makes it possible for individuals to sign up to receive information about upcoming elections, and uh, we, we wanted to expand that as well in terms of giving them voter information. Um, so uh, this was the bill that we had some some uh, questions about, and in the interim, uh, I met with um, representatives from Citizens Union, from the staff from CFB, to discuss some ways of tweaking this a little bit, or seeing um, how this could be done. Essentially, uh, what the bill provides is that we would be a vehicle for people to sign up to have um, to have uh, sign up for emails or text, hopefully. Uh, as well to uh, be notified of upcoming elections and it's another way of reaching people and getting them to um, remind them that, that their election is coming up and um, we our main concerns were whether the bill was flexible enough it was kind of rigid in how it was written and requirements of how many times people had to be noticed and uh, it was very specific in that respect as well as it didn't give people enough uh, opportunity to specify what they want to get. Do they want to get notices about, uh, specifically about the election day? Do they want notices about things other than just election day? So uh, we relayed some of those comments and uh, um, you know, the need for some flexibility in the drafting of it, we were told, uh, it's, it's a union belief that you know, that will come in the, in the uh, public meeting that will be held by the city council on that bill. And at that time, we could put in these comments. So, um, with that recommendation, you know, we, we discussed where we want to take it from here, and whether that would want to make a recommendation to the CFB to support it. What's the mechanics of doing that? So, we just wanted to have that discussion here as well. This is the first time we're actually moving to support a piece of legislation. Hopefully, the first of May. To come, so this is kind of we're working this out as we go along. Great. And we had a, we had an extra conversation about the campaign finance board. Um, and for the audience here, uh, for those who don't know, um, I'm also um, one of the four members of the, of the campaign finance board. Um, and the uh, and the BAC is a subsidiary of the uh, campaign finance board operation. Um, there's unanimous agreement among the board that um, we are free to make our own recommendations. The board would like to know about them, and they would like the opportunity to um, you know, comment and, and approve. Um, but um, that, in general, that that, that would be the process. We feel like we have the process going forward. So, could so just so I'm clear, so the recommendation would be uh, from the Voter Assistance Commission directly, let's say, in support of this piece of legislation directly to the council. Is that right? That's right. So, that's right. 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 They would review it and ask any questions, and then it would be up to us to present it to the city council. So I guess at this point, um, cool. we, have, we have this piece of legislation uh, pending before us from Citizens Union, and uh, uh, I guess we can take a direct, at this point, we can take a direct vote on uh, whether we want to support this legislation with the opportunity to. Uh, to set forth these specific um, uh, recommendations when the bill is discussed at the city council. Yes, absolutely. Uh, John, you worked on this bill. Did you have any any further input? The Citizens Union, I know, is involved in it as well. Uh, yes, I'm, I am on the board of Citizens Union, um, and uh, we we work in our positions to push forward this. I just think this is exactly the kind of common sense legislation we should be pushing using new technologies to increase voter information, uh, which will lead to increased voter turnout. Uh, and there's so many complex rules and dates about registration dates, et cetera. This, to me, should get filed under no brainer for us. Uh, I strongly Is there any other discussion? And just one other specific recommendation that John mentioned in terms of technology, we are recommending that they include text as well as email. Um, are there any, uh, any, other, any further questions? Any questions from the public? Do you want to make a motion to? Yes. So uh, I have a motion to approve. Motion. Any second? All there? Uh, aye. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for leaving that for us.
Perfect. So on uh, next, I guess we have a calendar of uh, next uh, scheduled meetings. I mean, this could actually be the thing that takes the longest. So I just wanted to <laughs> um, alert the committee that what we, we need to plan our uh, meeting schedule for the following, for 2012. And the charter requires that we meet by monthly. So according to my quick calculations, that means February, April, June, August, October, and December. Um, we also are mandated by the charter, seat the Hagen Hunt Board, to publish a report based on advice from the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee in April and have a hearing on after that report is issued. So um, unless our general counsel tells me otherwise, I assume that the June meeting could accomplish the purpose of being the hearing for that uh, uh, for the, that uh, for on that report. Um, but we also will need to have meetings to discuss the report and what the recommendations are going to be. So that being said, uh, I also one other calendaring issue would be because of what uh, chair. Uh, the chair just said, explained about the campaign finance board. It would be good if we had these meetings before the campaign finance board meeting, so that any uh, items that the needed to get to go to the campaign finance board for approval could be done expeditiously, and we would have to wait another month. And the campaign finance board meets monthly, so um, if people are prepared, I will just uh, suggest some dates. The campaign finance board meeting in February is on is on February 16th. So if we scheduled our meeting the week of February 6th, that would be the best. So I don't know if people prefer Monday nights. We have tended to have our meetings on Monday evenings. Um, if that's available to everyone. We will, that would be February 6th. Okay, I mean, these can also be subject to change. And I will send everyone a list after the meeting. Then in April, we would be talking about Monday, April 2nd, if that is acceptable to everyone. Then in June, it will be Monday, June 11th. Okay. In August, which is always the most difficult month to schedule anything at all. would be Monday, August 6th. And then, um, Monday, October 15th. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then the December hearing would be Monday, December 3rd. Okay, so I will send um, the list of dates and the times, and um, as we had discussed in a prior meeting, we would might we are going to try and do these um, in different boroughs uh, to attempt to have that schedule. Um, we may not want to send you the actual dates, you know exactly where we're going to happen yet, but we will try and uh, achieve that, at least some of the meetings not in the hands. So that is, if everyone is okay with that, I'll send you a schedule later this week. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, shall we um, uh, call our panelists for the yep. 
So, um, as uh, many of you are aware, um, every the past couple of years, um, under the leadership of uh, Anita Kikarbear, we have called um, sponsored a citywide um, slam poetry competition around um, around Y vote. And uh, this year's winner, uh, we call up to the stage. Ishmael. Ishmael from uh, my borough of Brooklyn. I'm very proud that he has won. And uh, he is a student at Kingsborough Community College. Good sir! That's something pure we once said. You tried to find the sun in so much neon, you forgot how we used to do things. <laughs> you don't stare at the railroad, you make it. You dream, then you build. That's pure. Someone shouts an idea. More arrive and there's a call to action. We used to call on each other, then the voices match. A lone star becomes a constellation, and there's vibrations that start to resonate the way mountains move more, and the railroad is complete, and there's so many mistakes. We make so many mistakes, but ain't that pure? The lump of hope that snowballs out the avalanche, bursts into fireworks and become atoms in the night sky, something pure, if you see it. Everything we haven't abused is pure. To vote is pure. So remember, my friend, the voice, will always grant us another chance to awaken. Good sir, you're next in line to vote now. And before I even thought to place a ballot, everything about being here started to make sense.
Over the past several years, along with many of my colleagues in Memorial, I have been, and uh, many activists in uh, the Brooklyn, Southern Brooklyn community, I have been urging the New York City Board of Elections to take steps to ensure that all Russian American New Yorkers can fully participate in the electoral process, regardless of their fluency in English. Unfortunately, there continue to be many potential voters that have been unfairly shut out of the voting process because of their lack of English language. Indeed, during past elections, I've been in polling sites where both Haitian and Russian voters had to re rely on other voters to assist them because of our failure to have translators or language-appropriate information and ballots. I'm sure that other speakers uh, will give many examples of uh, recent problems. Uh, unfortunately, all too often, our efforts to increase language accessibility have been met with the same response we follow the Federal Voting Rights Act. It was for that reason, based upon the large number of Russian Americans speaking New York City residents, that on the state level we passed legislation requiring that in New York City a number of specific election materials be made available in Russia. Uh, despite several years of this law being in effect, many of, uh, of these items have yet to be implemented by the city. However, and I think this is really the, the crux of, of what I'd like to say here today. We should not restrict our efforts to these limited requirements when we are looking to expand voter participation. The Federal Voting Rights Act requirements represent the minimum, say again, the minimum steps that boards of elections must take with respect to meeting the needs of language minority groups and does not include a more expansive approach to address concerns including to a large number of other minority groups. And as a former uh, chair of the Assembly's uh, Committee on Election Law, I am well aware, as I'm sure people keep and many of you are, that there are a number of provisions that authorize local boards of election to deem appropriate the use of languages other than English. For example, and I'll submit the written copies of my testimony, Election Law Section 4118 provides a local board may publish notices of the primary in languages other than English. Election Law 102 provides that a local board may post notices in language other than English that explain how to operate a voting machine. There are other sections, I'll just list the sections, section 4, 119, 4, 120, 7, 102, 8, 104, all containing similar language regarding the use of languages other than English for materials issued by state boards and local boards. Furthermore, I was a, a member of the Legislative Conference Committee that drafted the 2005 New York law to implement the, uh, the voting machines pursuant to the, the HAVA, the Help America Vote Act. And we explicitly included language that required the new machines be able to accommodate alternative language accessibility. Clearly, New York's law envisions counties beyond the voting rights of counties to have machines that have the ability to uh, have access to other languages. And uh, so there was no restriction limiting to the, uh, the Voting Rights Act designated languages. Making use of this type of flexibility in all aspects of voting information and materials is crucial in our city, where hundreds of languages are spoken, and we want to fulfill the promise of a democratic process. So without any further legislative authority, the City Board of Elections can immediately move to accommodate voters who speak additional languages by doing such things as translating all official web-based information documents that are tra currently translated into the covered, covered languages into additional languages such as uh, Russian that was required by the legislation. For example, if you try and find your poll site, only in the covered languages. It's not in any of the other multiple languages that are spoken in New York. The solicitation for poll workers does only solicits people who speak languages that are on covered voters' rights, the Federal Voting Act languages. It doesn't ask, do you speak another language so that we can accommodate citizens in our city who speak other languages and make use of the fact that we have many people who are bilingual who might want to serve as inspectors, and translating all official notices that are printed and published in newspapers and mailed to voters 
into languages that are appropriate for the communities in which they appear beyond just the covered languages. I think that uh, some of the, many of these steps can be taken immediately. All the steps in measure can be taken immediately are of very low cost and would greatly increase the participation of voters uh, who have uh, or not English uh, fluent which is a goal I think that we all share. Thank you. Can you just clarify uh, why the state legislation doesn't, that, that, that requires it, why that isn't being enacted? In other words, is the city not required to do that? The city is required to, to do that, but they have failed to do that. It took them uh, more than a year to do the web-based, Translation. It uh, took, and, and they're, they're, they're it's still not completely done. They failed to, they have failed to print uh, the required booklet that the law requires. There is no, no explanation. And, uh, you know, again, we did this legislation. The board could have done this without it. They refused to use their existing powers to do it. So that's why we had to, uh, we, we had to enact the legislation. But I would think a board member would be more appropriate to ask why they failed to fully enact the legislation. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alec Procrastine. I'm representing 46 Assembly District, part of Brighton Beach. Um, Coney Island area, Bay Beach and Dyker has very diverse history. Uh, I, have, I have my written testimony here. I'm going to submit them uh, to the committee. And uh, Chair Chang and members of the committee, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, well, uh, there is a law. Uh, there is a law, Chapter 244, Number 7 of New York State Election Law, requiring that voting materials in New York City and all municipalities with the population of a million or more are translated into Russian. Uh, you have many members of the Russian-speaking community who are just outraged by the failure of the Board of Elections to uh, implement the law that is required. Um, I don't think that I have to uh, defend the idea of the importance of the Russian language for the the voters, especially senior voters, since we already have a law in place. Uh, well, all I think we have to do, and the Russian-speaking community, and you, you're going to hear uh, some members and leaders and activists of the Russian-speaking community tonight. Uh, uh, the Russian-speaking community, I'm, I'm pretty sure about it, will be fighting for the uh, for the. Um, uh, implementing this law, and uh, um, it's not only that uh, we have many, many seniors in the Russian-speaking community who are uh, maybe possessed enough knowledge of uh, English language to pass the citizenship exam, but when it comes to the Board of Elections lingua, they just cannot understand every word of it, and that's why the the uh, we cannot overestimate the importance of the translation of uh, some materials, materials that uh, at least required by law to be translated, uh, those materials uh, to be translated into uh, Russian language. Um, in addition to this law, we have now an executive order that uh, executive order was signed into the law a couple months ago by the governor Poole. And that uh, executive order is requiring the state departments speak to the people whom they servicing in the uh, languages, seven, seven languages in particular, was signed two months ago by the governor Paul. This particular law, law was signed uh, by then governor Patterson in 2009. So it's been two years since the law is not well. It, it, it was in effect, uh, was supposed to be in effect in January 2010. We have to, we have to make sure that the Board of Elections will implement this law. 
um, you have many, many people who are outraged by, by this situation. They uh, choose this country to live in, and uh, um, well, for many, for many different factors, but I think the, the major factor is, at least that was the factor, factor for myself, is the fact that uh, this is a land of war. This country is a land of war. And, uh, well, we're under impression that if there is a written law signed by the governor almost two years ago, that was supposed to be in effect. And that law is supposed to be conducted properly and obeyed by the Board of Elections. I have my written testimony, I'm not going to read that because of a lack of time, and uh, I think uh, I, I said what I wanted to say in addition to my esteemed palace words, so I will submit, uh, uh, I will submit my, my testimonies, but please, I know that I'm talking to the advisory committee, but this is extremely important for many, many people just to, uh, uh, just to make sure that those people who came here uh, to this land, as a land of war, we will continue to consider our plan as a land of war. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the minor question for you, but I think it would help uh, those of us in the community and also lots of the, the public that are here today. Um, how many Russian speakers, um, speaking voters, are there in New York City? Uh, I'm sure it was speaking about half a minute. Yes, there is an anecdotal information about the million people. But again, uh, according to the uh, organizations that were um, taking care of people coming to the New York City as immigrants, as illegal immigrants, we have more than half a million. And uh, uh, knowing that approximately 40, 43% of them are over the age of 65, you know how many people needs this law to be in effect and, and actually to, to become reality. Thank you. And do you have a sense of how the, the absence of Russian and, and other, other languages, what sort of qualitatively or anecdotally or quantitatively, what impact it actually has on, on voting? Well, it, it, has, um, it has a direct effect and indirect effect. Uh, the direct effect that some of those seniors are just afraid to go to the uh, election uh, to the ease and vote just because they don't possess the, the in, in their opinion the proper knowledge of the English language and indirectly some people at the ease they uh, uh, really can be given they else can be affected because some, sometimes you have a situation where people are uh, uh, starting to argue with the inspectors, with the people um, who are supposed to oversee the process of the election process in, in, uh, on the EDs, at the EDs. And uh, uh, because of the lack of language, they, they just cannot find a mutual ground. So people just turning around without voting, without exercising their right to vote, they turning around at the limit. And it just uh, I don't think any of us in this room will want to see this happen in New York City, in New York State. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For a second. I just want to acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by Senator Member Brian Kavanaugh, and also I neglected to mention uh, your presence uh, remind me of the technological uh, portion is that we're live streaming our hearing and also that we are uh, reading on um, this uh, comments from the audience and uh, from uh, members of the public at the, the hashtag NYC votes. Thank you very much. I know it's been great. This is Bob here. Anyway, my name is Gail Brewer and I represent uh, from 54th Street to 96th Street on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, and I'm delighted to be here at the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. I also chair the governmental operations of the council and we have oversight over the Board of Elections. I'm just going to talk more generally than my two esteemed um, colleagues from the assembly so you probably forget everything that I said. I might also. 
but it's only because I have so many little pieces, and maybe together we can make them work. So first of all, is to thank the Board of Elections, as well as you and people in the audience of the government groups working with the City's Department of Technology to put together a sample ballot. This is really a huge accomplishment, and I think we know that as of the November uh, 2011 general elections, people can actually know before they go to the voting booth what is on the ballot. This is a big deal. But I can tell you what that could do is to help make sure that people know about it. In other words, the outreach to tell people not only can they find their voting place, but also they can know in advance for the primaries next year and the general, that would be very helpful. I think that's a role that needs to be filled. I also want to mention that I'm going to talk about a couple of things. One is just staffing in general, and maybe talk a little bit about language along those lines, and then what I call end-of-the-day tabulation, which is a nightmare. And then finally, um, some suggestions. Again, staffing is more, I know, the purview of the uh, Board of Elections. But there really, is, there really are a lot of issues and, and differences of opinion between sometimes the government groups and sometimes the district leaders as to the best method for staffing. And there are people in this room who know a whole lot more about this than I do. But I can tell you, there really are a lot of questions with a new manual, uh, a new machine, and sometimes more complicated ways of getting the information out, and it's caused a lot of challenges. So I think we should know how many workers are required for the primary and general election day. That's something that the Board of Elections should know. Some job descriptions, some standard performance evaluation for each job. Um, I know that coordinators have complained that sometimes when the workers' performance is unsatisfactory, their input is disregarded. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And just the whole issue of, of uh, making sure that there are workers there for the primary and the general, yes. You get a little bit extra money for doing that. But then year to year to year, how do you keep qualified people returning? And do you do split shifts or not? I don't know. People have different of opinions on that. Could you be there from 5 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, even though officially 9, but there are reasons why you might have to stay there. I wanted to talk about this issue of language. And again, my esteemed colleagues have said it's so articulate, but this is my question. The district leaders complained to me that some of the, that the material is excellent in terms of the training material, but it's only in English. And so if you have somebody who wants to staff a community poll site, a site in our neighborhood, they have to have gone through the training in English, and then they have to actually pass the test in English. Maybe that's a good thing. But the fact of the matter is, at least in my neighborhood, there are a lot of Spanish-speaking dominant workers who have been there for 100 years, literally, or maybe 80 years. They're known to the neighborhood, or maybe their grandchildren and their children, I'm being a little facetious, but they've been there for a while, they are very well known, and they provide a list of duty, according to the district leaders. And I understand that, because of those of us who vote year after year, a friendly face. And they bring, they let people know in a comfort, comfort zone that this is a place that they can vote and be comfortable about it. At the same time, there are other people who feel that sort of like the Department of Motor Vehicles, you should take a test first. And if you take a test, then you can go and take the training. That does exempt some people. And what's the language for all of this? I know that there are interpreters at the poll sites. I understand that. But that's not, according to some, enough to make people feel comfortable in their own language. So I think this is this whole language issue is something that needs to um, have more have more discussion. I just want to mention also the whole issue of staffing. Um, we need to look at those who are coming to the polls um, because somebody didn't show up. What's the best way to get people to show up? Is it to have people from their neighborhood go to the local poll site? Sometimes they go to the local poll site, sometimes they're set far away. Your neighbor may end up in the neighborhood, but you end up far away. It's an issue to look at. Um, I also want to look at the issue of um, the people who are not, who are sort of um, going to be there if you don't show up. Apparently you get told uh, the night before or maybe that morning. So the question is if you know because the coordinator has called everybody uh, who's going to be at his or her site, shouldn't they be able to get there 
uh, get that information to get there at 5 o'clock in the morning. Our train to figure out how to do this with technology. So good the wonderful people who are IT at the Board of Elections, but we need a bigger push. I do believe that technology should play a much bigger role um, as we go forward. Now, in some cases, even the materials that are sent to the board, to the coordinators, could be online. Right now, everything goes in the mail, hundreds of hours of stapling, and then it goes out to the coordinators. Maybe we could do technology to send that. Some people don't have a computer, they could go in the mail, but a lot of people have one. At the end of the day, tabulation is a nightmare. I've watched it, some of you may have watched it. It needs constant attention. The fact of the matter is, we are stapling, we are scotch taping, we are cutting these little pieces of paper with uh, gym-sized lights. You write on one piece of paper, it goes through to the next piece of paper. Believe it or not, I'm just giving you a tip of the nightmare. And you're there till 11.30 at night. Now, there was this, an experiment in Queens where the police officers took what I would call a memory stick to the first supposedly to the Board of Elections in Queens. Somehow it took a long time. It didn't end up saving time. I, I mentioned all this because in Nassau County, they figured out how to get a memory stick or a flash drive from, with the information, from the poll site to the Board of Elections without a lot of challenges. We have to figure out together. Board of Elections can do it, but other ideas are welcome. How to make the tabulation at the end of the day something that is um, readable, that the press gets their information, that those of us waiting to find out what the results are get the unofficial tabs and the technology is used, not just the short version. I want to also mention, um, Councilmember Cavanaugh has a wonderful uh, piece of legislation all day. I'm sure we'll talk about it to make the ballots simpler so that the languages can exist, that there are is room so that those of us who can't see uh, point four of a little facetious font can actually read the ballot. And there are some wonderful ideas about how to do that. We need to implement them. It is not possible for the public to understand why this can't be done and double negatives. We've got to figure out a way. We have to, as a state and as a city, advocating how to make a ballot. doesn't have as many symbols on it. Take some of the needless, ridiculous instructions off of it. Makes a font that we can actually read. And that would be something that I hope that the back would, would uh, advocate for. I also want to mention, of course, that the uh, Reddit Center just did a really good uh, report on overvote protection. And again, overvoting taking place, I'm sure you saw it. Again, technology-wise, we should be able to solve that problem. That is not an insurmountable uh, issue. So I bring some of these issues uh, to your attention. I think that with the uh, new scanners, there's lots of opportunity, but there are also a lot of challenges from staffing, end of the day tabulation, a better ballot, and trying to figure out how to uh, look at the uh, language issues in a holistic way. Thank you very much. Thank you, I'm Assemblymember Brian Cavanaugh. I uh, represent the district on the east side of Manhattan, like in the Lower East Side, up to the United Nations, along the East River. And I also chair the Assembly Subcommittee on Election Day Operations and Voter Disenfranchisement, which has the uh, distinction of being the second longest uh, name of any committee uh, in the Assembly. We're working on that. Um, it's great to be here today with, with all of you. Uh, I, I thank you and congratulate you for uh, getting up and holding this hearing on this very important topic today. I apologize for not having a hashtag or an ID or whatever it is that I'm supposed to make my name blue up there. But I'm going to work on that. Um, and uh, it is also just great. I have two of my colleagues from the Assembly who do a terrific job of, of representing uh, their communities on this and some of the other issues. And uh, I'm going to try not to, although the upper has done some resolutions on some of the bills that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try not to repeat myself. Some of you may know that it was once my job, more or less, to say things like upper had already said, but um, in other capacity. Uh, I, I just really want to talk about, um, in, in, my, in this role, which I've had now for a year and a half, um, I have had the opportunity to see how the new uh, machines, the, the paper ballot on people's scan systems have been implemented uh, in counties across the state. Um, I've met with election officials in various counties. I have uh, gone in person uh, and with my staff uh, to uh, 10 counties uh, across the state while these while the machines are actually in place on election day while the polls are open to talk with both workers and staffers. Um, and obviously I've seen uh, a 
a wide range of the experience we've had in New York uh, with the machine. And it's fair to say that although I'm somebody that thinks that these machines are uh, an improvement over, over the uh, prior machines for various reasons, I don't think to reopen that uh, debate, which happens they just in some quarter of stealth. Um, we really haven't got the right uh, the implementation of the machines, and there are difficulties that both uh, decrease the confidence of voters have in the system, and also in many cases are actually an obstacle to uh, people exercising their right and their duty to cast a ballot. Uh, so I just want to talk about a few of those today. Um, the first is, uh, as, as Councilmember Brewer mentioned, uh, ballot design. Um, it happens that we as a society at this point have an enormous amount of experience to bring to bear on the question of how to design a piece of paper so an ordinary person can look at it and understand what they're supposed to do and do that properly so that the machine will be able to read that piece of paper. Uh, we've been administering tests on paper that gets optically scanned. We've got all kinds of forms that are optically scanned. The ballot design in New York currently does not reflect uh, the best practices in that area uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that in many uh, cases, uh, election administrators designing uh, ballots have not taken advantage of that kind of that kind of expertise in designing the ballot. And there are some aspects of the New York City ballot uh, that could be changed in a way that would be effective within current law. Uh, the second reason is that in many cases, the state law still requ has requirements that actually impede effective ballot design. Uh, Councilmember Brewer mentioned one of them. There is a very long uh, and uh, poorly worded and confusing set of instructions that are actually spelled out word for word in the statute um, and really cannot help people understand what they need, what they need to do. Um, there are various requirements. There's a requirement that a more of a cartoon figure of a Google hand with a finger pointing um, is required to be placed on, on, on ballots in our state. Um, there are font requirements that are actually uh, problematic to make things. Research shows uh, make ballots more difficult rather than easier to use. Uh, so we have, we have two bills on the subject that we've been working on. One is a fairly straightforward bill that I've been working on with uh, Senator Adabo from Queens, uh, who is the ranker on the Senate uh, Election Committee, which basically just deals with the font size issue and a couple other minor issues uh, which are important. Um, the second is called, or we uh, call it the Voter Friendly Ballot Act, and it's a fairly comprehensive bill that is intended to reflect the best practices. Uh, it has uh, benefited from input from you know, the Brennan Center. There's a Usability Professionals Association out there that has looked at this and given input. Uh, there's uh, the Pew Center has done a lot of work on this issue. And most importantly, we get to benefit from uh, ballot design in other states that are a little further along in this process. We really do need to implement a change in the statute that will both that will mandate certain things that will be mandated, to a little more flexibility to uh, election administrators, and most importantly, remove some of the requirements that are actually not helpful. Uh, so I do look forward to you know your review and input on this issue. Obviously, getting getting the exact mix of elements of that uh, statute is still a work in progress, but we'll be taking this up uh, in the uh, coming session, uh, and that's something we've discussed with the state board and the uh, state law election. Association as well, and we'll be looking for partners uh, in the Senate on that as well. Uh, the second uh, topic I just wanted to discuss uh, is uh, the overvote uh, issue that uh, Councilor Bird has mentioned, and I know Brennan Center and some of our uh, friends in the press have uh, been uh, focused on. Uh, first of all, I'd just say the fact that so many people got this piece of paper and were unable to discern how to use it in such a way that they overvote it is just, again, the symptom of what I've been talking about, which is a need for ballots that are more clearly designed so people don't have that, that kind of issue. Uh, but no matter how you design a ballot, some fraction of voters are going to overvote. And it's a critical question how the machines do that. And there are two different kinds of problems we need to be concerned about. First is just uh, arbitrariness, and the second is introducing bias into our election system. Now, obviously, if a certain fraction of all people who vote are not permitted to vote uh, because they don't understand what's going on or because the, the machine is not handling uh, the ballot in a way that prompts them to correct a the problem that they would be inclined to correct, that is just, you know, if that happened across the board, it might arbitrarily affect election results. Occasionally, it might even affect the outcome. If you have a system where some parts of a jurisdiction are have their ballots are being handled in one way, 
and another place, another part of the jurisdiction of handling in a different way that differentially affects the rate at which people vote in that area. What you are doing is biasing the election in favor of the choices in a different jurisdiction. So the system we have now, where some jurisdictions like New York City have chosen uh, a method that data now shows very substantially undercounted the vote here, is very problematic. It's problematic in a local election that occurs entirely within New York City because it makes the results more arbitrary and disenfranchises certain voters. It's even more problematic in a statewide election where some parts of the state are counting or are handling those balances differently and raising the rate of, of votes being counted in those areas. So it's a really critical issue. Um, it, it's good news that the state board is now putting out clear instructions about warnings. Uh, this is an issue that was raised last year, uh, fairly late in the process, I'll say, in the defense of the New York City Board of Elections. Um, but it really is an issue we should address. And the way it seems to address it is to have the machines be required to give the data back and have the person have the opportunity to correct it. It seems to be the, the, from studies across the country and certainly here, that seems to be the way to actually make sure that people have the right to vote because you board there to vote. Um, I want to just mention, briefly mention the end of the day tabulation issue that uh, Councilman Burr spoke about as well, and she articulated it well. Um, we seem to be the only jurisdiction in New York City on the planet that has interpreted uh, the law and the use of these uh, uh, the use of these machines to require uh, tape and scissors and numerous little slips of paper to take around all day. Um, and I honestly, I'm, a, I'm an attorney. Um, I've read the election law. I've read the conflicting piece of statute. I don't really have a legal thing about who's correct about this. Uh, maybe New York City is getting it right on the law and everybody else is getting it wrong. But if the law is such that that's what it requires, and, and we just simply need to change the law, and we are open to suggestions how to do that, um, it seems the best way to do it is to do it in such a way uh, that does not require changes in the programming of the machines. The easiest way to do that is to make it clear that you can take, as, as Councilman Brewer mentioned, you can take this electronic device out, you can put it in some secure, some, some, uh, secure transportation system. I'm not even going to try to think about electronically transmitting it because I know there is a lot of concerns for you. But get it to a place, plug it into the machine, count it. Um, we, many of us at the state level, have heard this from all sides and are very interested in resolving this problem with legislation if necessary. And we're very interested in uh, hopefully you're joining us because this is. And this is an issue as much as anything with the voter experience. There is a, a widespread perception, even among people who participate in the voting system, that there's a, this tabulation problem that takes hours for New York City to figure out who voted and how many. And by the city board estimates, the city board elections estimates, as I, as I understand them, there is an 8% difference between the final result as announced and the numbers they're getting out of this process on election night. That kind of an eight percent swing makes people think that somebody out there doesn't have an account. It's a very big problem for people for the integrity, perceived integrity, of the system is not for the actual integrity. Um, for what I just want to mention, one of the main reasons that people in our system uh, do not have the opportunity to vote is because of voter registration glitches. Uh, so this may be outside of the experience of what goes on on election day, uh, but we many of us have been trying to work on the issue of how to modernize that voter registration system. I have personally had an experience, many others have had experience of uh, getting to the board elections, getting the right form, and, and having essentially your change of address or your initial registration or your change of party or whatever is simply not taken. So you show up, call site, and your name isn't there. Some of those voters vote on that to do on affidavit ballots. Some of them do it repeatedly and just think that's you know, sort of the way they vote. Um, and in most cases, those votes are not being counted. Uh, so we've got a couple of things we've worked on. One is a modernization, a voter registration modernization uh, process that would allow much more of the data that goes from various agencies that are all ready mandated to uh, allow voters to register, have that happen electronically. Some people call this automatic registration. Um, I, too, I prefer not to call it automatic because we do want to respect the uh, right as an expressive act to choose not to participate. And people believe that in America, and I, I do, but um, it should be the case that if you have interaction with an agency that gets your address correctly and you have and you express an interest motion to vote, that that data is transmitted automatically. It will save uh, board selections in New York City and across the state. The uh, very time-consuming and labor-intensive and expensive process of getting, of getting those forms of data and voting for elections and getting lists done, and it will dramatically increase the integrity of those lists. 
there are, just briefly, uh, we also have some of the more draconian rules on, on how to make the world enrollment changes uh, in New York uh, City, which is effectively disenfranchising, uh, and uh, also just deadlines that are uh, excessively far from elections. We should at least bring those down to the minimum constitutional minimum of 10 days rather than 25 days. Finally, I just want to throw one other issue out there that's maybe not timely for this year, but it's something we need to think on about now if we're going to change it. Uh, we currently, in New York City, have a mandated uh, runoff vote for citywide elections. If somebody in the first election does not get 40% of the vote, that is a critical opportunity for voters to make sure that they are casting their ballot for a candidate for citywide office that has uh, a majority of people who choose to vote behind them. The current law simply is not workable with the new machines and with the, uh, the federal move act. And, and the spirit of federal move act is that people who need to vote by absentee ballot should be permitted to do so. Uh, there is simply no way for, to have a physical runoff two weeks after and have ballots that are useful for that. So we know the current system doesn't work. There are two different approaches to this that have been considered in Maui. One is to simply eliminate the runoff, uh, to say you don't need a runoff and somebody who gets, you know, 20 percent of the vote can be the mayor. Um, I would suggest that that is not in the interest of a diverse city like our own uh, to not have a, have a process that um, that generates uh, a, a candidate that can build consensus. The obvious alternative of that is uh, sometimes called preferential voting, sometimes called instant runoff voting. Um, I have been working with colleagues on a bill that would essentially change the law in New York from a physical runoff that's something that costs between 15 and 20 million dollars to implement, and a simple instant runoff system where people cast their first choice and their second choice and their third choice on the first day of election. Turnout is higher, it changes the way people campaign because they tend to campaign in a more positive, issue-oriented way, um, and most importantly, it's, more, it's just more democratic. The current machines in New York that uh, are the, 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 the SMS machines that are, that are usable here are used for this purpose in other jurisdictions, including some municipalities in California. There are some questions about what kind of programming teams would be necessary. I emphasize this now because if we try to sort this out during the course of a citywide election, uh, we are going to have a lot of people who are politically involved having a great deal of concern about how this can affect the particular fortunes of their candidate. So it is something we should do as early as possible in the system. And I, I would look forward to all of your thoughts and inputs on that uh, issue as well. Um, and uh, just let me share that here. So again, thank you all for being here and for the opportunity. Regarding the, um, the language uh, legislation, is there a way that we could be on record to advocate for the implementation of that law? Uh, is there something we could do at least uh, advocate for something that's already a law and advocate for its implementation? Absolutely. We can do that. So, a question for um, someone in the House of Council of I think that. Wonderful hearing after the uh, election of voting technology and was terrific and the good leadership. Um, uh, Senator, you, you, you raised um, just a number of bills that you were sponsoring or sponsoring at the front of the assembly that would help improve the rest of the issues that you talked about. Can you just describe quickly just kind of where they are and what can be done by the people in this room and by the, by the people in the city and gentlemen at large to help move that process along? Uh, legislating in this area is just about uh, the most complicated thing you try to do in the morning because uh, I always say when I have an agricultural issue and I have to go to the agriculture committee, I've got a chair of the agriculture committee who's a farmer. Uh, with election law, it's pretty much like everybody's a farmer. Okay? Uh, and for each, each of the 212 members of the legislature are in this business and have a very strong interest in how it works and often have very strong uh, convictions about what uh, is best for folks. Uh, that's one of the reasons it's important that, that organizations that, that bodies like this uh, and the general public are uh, interested really weigh in on and make sure they're, they are communicating their experience uh, to folks. 
Um, the the uh, Water Funding Ballot Act uh, is something that uh, we, because we have, uh, and it's also, I'll say, very important that issues like this are resolved in a manner that's bipartisan, and that's important in principle. It also happens to be, uh, given the configuration of the 2000 legislature, uh, essential um, to actually pass a law. Um, so we have had conversations on, on the Water Funding Ballot Act, we've been working uh, with the, I mentioned the Election Commissioners Association because that is the body that has a Republican and a Democrat from every county um, and from the and from New York City. Um, they have had uh, a segment of that which they, they spoke at, uh, at, their, at their statewide conference last year on uh, usability of ballots. Um, and, you know, we've also been working with, with the state Senate. Uh, but it is important that uh, we get a big push here in New York City. Obviously, a very substantial fraction of my colleagues particularly in the Democratic Conference of the Assembly, uh, are from New York City. And we need to go that these are issues that we need to take. It takes tremendous time and energy um, to resolve these complex issues. Um, we need to hear from ordinary citizens out there. We need to hear from bodies like this that these need to be made priorities in the give and take and all that. We need to come up with bills that we can actually pass and get signed into law. Perfect. And I might ask Councilman Brewer how to leverage social media to get the board out. Well, I was going to mention we did pass a resolution to the City Council in support. So the City of New York is officially on record. That doesn't help it pass necessarily in Albany, but just so you know, we did pass that resolution in support of this bill. Thank you. Great. Any um, I, I just want to point out to those, like Assemblyman Kavanaugh and myself, who don't tweet on a regular basis, we've given an opportunity for you to provide your comments in the old-fashioned writing it on paper way. <laughs> um, and so you, if you want to fill out one of these cards, you know, we, will, uh, we will have someone on our staff tweet your comments for you. We, this guy, he has a, well, he's got one up there, I think. At least you need one. <laughs> I brought stamps. and Deputy Commissioner Ashwini Chabra of the TLC. I'm sorry if I totally butchered anyone's name. And um, we also have a representative of Assemblyman Simbowitz's uh, offices. And I am going to like to pronounce your name because I'm absolutely going to butcher your name. Ilya Novostovsky. Um, as, uh, as the chair of this committee, I am inviting anyone to take off their jackets. It's very warm here, so uh, it will be not seen as any good if you do that. I also want to remind you that uh, we've actually run behind time, so if you can keep the comments for three minutes, I'd uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so we're going
I've heard from some non-voters that they feel that the government isn't on their side, so they don't see the point in voting. But I try to make those individuals understand that they can change things, that maybe it's the incumbent, the uh, president, the governor, the mayor, the mayor, borough president, or other elected officials that aren't on their side. And that we, in fact, do have the power, the privilege, and the duty to change what we don't like about government. That's one of the things that makes this country so great. Now, the Commission on Human Rights and the Voter Assistance Commission are looking to get that message out on a massive scale. We are going to produce a short film highlighting the fact that voting is a human right. The film will be centered around the naturalization ceremony at 26 Federal Plaza, where CCHR and DAC multilingual staff members meet with the naturalized citizens and help them fill out voter registration cards. We will have stories from some of the new Americans about how they were unable to vote or about their voting experiences in their native country. The film will also feature clips of black Americans and women waiting online when they were finally given the right to vote. And we will just suppose that in today's sad reality, no lines at the polls. Putting an emphasis on how excited the new citizens are about the right to vote, as well as the fact that it wasn't that long ago that many of us couldn't vote. And that's my reality. I'm from Mississippi, and I tell everyone that my grandfather voted for the first time when I was in the second grade, so hands that pick cotton can now pick legislators. And so we're going to send this powerful message to New Yorkers about the privilege that so many of them take for granted. We plan on commencing production of the short film in the next couple of months. The final cut of the film will air on both the CCHR website and the Campaign Finance Board website over the all throughout 2012, leading into the September primary election and the November general election. We will also put the film on YouTube and work on generating a buzz to make it go viral. I don't know how to do that, but I'm just to do it. My guys know how to do that. And the call to action will be crystal, crystal clear. Why should you vote? Well, because you can. I'm excited about rolling out this film and helping all New Yorkers understand the rights and privileges that our democratic system affords us. So thanks again. We look forward to our continued collaboration with the Voter Assistance Commission. And um, you know, I'm hoping to go viral soon. <laughs> Thank you. It sounds so bad, but it's good. <laughs> That's what they tell me. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Herb Wago, and I'm Chief of Staff at the Department of Youth and Community Development. And first of all, I want to say I, you know, I, I'm very disappointed to not have uh, succeeded in my bid to be the poet laureate this year. <laughs> uh, but but I, I want to congratulate, congratulate Ishmael Islam on a terrific job. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chang and uh, Ms. Myers and members of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. On behalf of Commissioner Jeannie Malgrath, thank you for inviting DYCD to participate this afternoon's public hearing of this evening, uh, public hearing on voter engagement and the New York City elections. DYCD is delighted to have been a partner throughout the year with the NYC Campaign Finance Board and the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Odita Mayors has been an outstanding partner with DYCD and has been available whenever we request the process. We have had a long partnership, and this past year alone, we have worked on a number of successful initiatives. As a youth serving agency, we believe the Youth Board Laureate Program is really a terrific way to energize young voices throughout the city with spoken word. We've included live performances at DYC events for youth enrolled in a number of our programs. The Poet Laureate was a definite highlight of our Teen Action Youth Forum last spring. We know that this effort uh, has been effective as a vote voter registration tool that we registered 31 new voters at the Youth Poet Ambassador performance at our latest community workshop, also this past spring. On other fronts, the committee has presented on how to encourage voter participation to directors of DYCD's 80 Beacon program, which as you know, serve thousands of young people and families throughout the city. Anita herself presented at this year before my agency's extended cabinet a monthly meeting of DYCD's managing leadership team. DYCD distributes voter registration materials to thousands of our providers to ensure that residents across the city are given the opportunity and the informa in information to participate in elections. We also hosted four voter spotlights on the front page of DYCD uh, webpage, informing New Yorkers on election deadlines and information. 
These efforts are intended to complement DYCD programs designed to build leadership skills and encourage young people to get involved in the community. With the presidential election less than a year away, we look forward to continuing to partner with uh, New York City Campaign Finance Board and the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. The election will be a great opportunity for young people to become more involved in their community and participate in the electoral process. We need our young people, and frankly, many more adults to learn about the issues that should be important to them. We need them to learn about the candidates for state and federal offices, to watch the debates, and to become informed voters. Our commitment as an agency is to create programs that challenge young people to think critically about how they can affect the issues that are important to them. We continue to always look for ways of creating a path to action. For example, this year, our Summer of Service Initiative engaged 2,000 young people in 16 uh, community service projects across the five boroughs. Everything from opening a farmer's market on Staten Island to cultivating a community garden in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I can easily envision next summer's efforts including motor registration initiatives. Finally, we currently have on our website information on obtaining all forms of ID. That's, that link has received a lot of positive attention. We'll be adding a new section uh, in the next, uh, next couple of weeks on how to register to vote that we hope will be similarly received. We look forward to continuing to work with the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee and, of course, we meet Anita Howard Mayer. On behalf of DYCD, thank you again for the opportunity to present this afternoon. I can read it over again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the committee. My name is Ashwani Chopper. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Planning and Tax and Visiting Commission. Um, the TLC has worked closely with the Campaign Finance Board and the uh, uh, to ensure that we're making voter registration forms available to all our licensees at our Long Island City uh, facilities where our licensees have more for inspections. We do so by including these materials in the application packets that applicants pick up when applying for a license, and they're also available at, our, at the TLC tribunal. Um, in addition, we've highlighted four voter spotlights on the front page of our home page informing New Yorkers who visit our sites on the election day and ask for information to get there too. What we're most excited about now is a recent, we recently launched surveys in the back seats of taxi, the taxi TV screens. Starting in late October, uh, passengers have had the ability to take short passenger surveys, mostly related to temp taxi service, uh, as we uh, roll, roll the program out. In the last six weeks, we've received over 140,000 responses to these questions, averaging about 3,000 respondents a day. Uh, when you consider that there are about 600,000 passengers in yellow taxis uh, every day, focusing mostly on Manhattan, it's a, it's a sizable data set, and it's a, it's a source of information that we previously did not have. Um, it's the first time we're able to communicate directly with taxi passengers and get their feedback, which is helping us formulate and craft our policies going forward. Surveys thus far have allowed us to get feedback on questions that we couldn't get anywhere else other than from passengers. For example, how well are you able to communicate with your driver? Is your driver using a horn? Is your driver using a cell phone? How long did you have to wait for this taxi? This is a powerful tool, and we hope to share the tool with our sister agencies. Campaign Finance Board was one of the first agencies to reach out to us to seek the use of this tool, and as we develop it, and as we make it available to other agencies, uh, we hope to work closely with the ASD to tailor surveys around elections starting next year to, uh, to make this available. Um, we will also be working to highlight the surveys by by highlighting the public service announcements also on the tax and TV screens that let people know about the coming elections. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, this question is for you, would anybody else be interested in this? And that is one of the problems, it seems to me, is that most, a lot of people in New York City, including a substantial number of you, don't know who they are elected officials are or what they do. So is there any role that you see DYC be playing in correcting that and essentially doing a civic deprecation? Well, again, I think, and it's been a sort of topic, a sort of theme throughout this testimony today, I think we're, we're getting very heavily into social media. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we uh, I think we have Facebook, we have something like 3,000 uh, friends on Facebook. We do an e-blast about 15,000. 
uh, young people, they have a lot of information on our website, and, and we're currently redesigning our website, so it's going to be for nonprofits on one side that are contract vendors, um, and we often will have a section for young people, and that's uh, and that's good feedback that we can include uh, information like that. We can include a, a link to the, the um, campaign finance board, where you can just plug in your address and get a list of uh, uh, your elected officials. And again, I mean, this was a topic that, that was covered in school when I was in school. I mean, you find out when you're elected officials, you write letters to your elected officials, so uh, you know, maybe it's something for you know, other agencies to consider as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank this panel who are representatives from the agencies that are part of our city law, local law 29, to distribute voter materials, but this is what they kept on shows how much further they're going beyond the mere distribution of voting materials. And I really want to uh, thank Stuart Armstrong from our staff who has been working really, really hard with the media, with the, the representatives here um, in their agencies to improve the work of these agencies to extend beyond just passing out voter registration forms. I really thank you. Next panel is we have a series of community groups and media institutions. Uh, uh, HIAS Mario, uh, Director Jean Borsch, uh, Rebecca Ain, um, the Anita Person, Second Vice President of Brooklyn and NAACP, and Reggie Nance, the Director of Insight Hot 97 XFF. The organization that I have privileged in other public for several years uh, called Civic and Water Education Initiative of the Russian American New Yorkers. And I believe that I need to distribute the fact sheet. Yes. And you can have the opportunity to see what this organization is all about. Uh, I don't want to waste your time. It's been a long evening, and there are many people who really spoke. But uh, I just want to bring to your attention that the Russian American leadership of this community working very hard to make sure that the Russian American New Yorkers have all the chances to become an active and effective part of uh, mainstream European Union and the American large. <coughs> Since we started this work, and it's uh, we're all volunteers, not paying, we have a network of countries, of activists citywide, to try to do the very complicated and very difficult work to convince the Russian American New Yorker to uh, do whatever we meant to do when we arrived in this country to become a lawful and rightful citizens of this country. I have to tell you that by many, many measures, our work considered to be very successful. And if you will read the fact sheet that I passed to you, you will see that we are doing a lot of activities trying to enroll as many as possible Russian American New Yorkers to become uh, registered voters and to be active during the election campaign. I want to thank the New York Finance Board for being a great partner, giving us all the assistance that we need, helping us to organize 
World Air War Response, helping us in many ways to uh, organize public events and uh, water registration drives. However, I want to concentrate not on successful part of our work, but the problems that we are facing. And I would like you, member of this council, to help us to overcome the difficulties that we are facing. The major problem is the lack of cooperation from Board of Election City of New York. And I have to tell you, not, not reiterating what you have heard from the elected officials, as uh, like our other progressive assembly, as uh, from uh, Brighton Beach and his colleague, uh, Assemblywoman Helen Weissie. For a number of years, we're trying to establish a line of communication, trying to work closely with the Board of Election, trying to get a partnership and offer to the community like ours can offer to the uh, Board of Election. The Russian American community is the third officially recognized active group here in New York. As you have heard, it's uh, several hundred thousand people who live in this New York and uh, this city uh, are eligible and they are citizens of uh, uh, America. But for many reasons, especially for the background that they brought from former Soviet Union, that we flee in order to escape the persecution and oppression. Unfortunately, we have a problem to explain to our compatriots, the Russian American New Yorkers, what's going on, why the city agency, like a board of election, do not want to implement the law that they obligated to do. Why we don't have cooperation from this important city agents, why they don't want to work with the community leadership, and many, many other questions. Just to uh, give you the end of what they know, I want to, to tell you that according to our research that we made, at the board of election, out of more than 100 workers, we have only one Russian American who is bilingual and who can somehow manage and help the entire community of 100,000 people to uh, obtain certain information because they, they fail to provide it in both ways, in printing and on their website. They we have, I can read you, I can tell you how many uh, printing material they're supposed to print and they just don't do it. But uh, instead of this, I just would like to push or make of this council to support and use the strong language to put the pressure of board election and let them know that the entire community very frustrated and they will not take it anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Rebecca Ain and I'm from Care for the Homeless. I want to thank you for having me here today to present our clients. Care for the Homeless, we provide health care, human services, and shelter to approximately 9,000 clients each year. We serve families and individuals in four out of the five boroughs, at locations ranging from shelters to soup kitchens. Our work meeting the needs of our, of our clients includes not only providing medical and behavioral health services, but also removing the barriers to voting that many people face as a result of being homeless. 
It is essential to do extensive outreach for special populations, such as homeless people, whose voice too often goes unheard. This past year, with aid from the Campaign Finance Board and the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, we visited five residential sites where we registered clients to vote. Many of these now registered voters otherwise would not register, otherwise would not vote, and in some cases, would not even know that they were eligible to do either. We will certainly continue this collaborative effort in the coming year. Confusion surrounding eligibility requirements constitutes, arguably, the most significant barrier to voting among our homeless clients. This barrier is also the easiest to remove. Through simply clarifying eligibility requirements, we can empower an entire group of people, in this case our homeless clients, to understand that they too can contribute their voices to the political dialogue of the city, state, and country. It is vital that the VAAC continues its stellar job of ensuring that special populations like New York City's homeless voters, have the necessary resources to engage civically and the adequate information to believe in the benefits of doing so. In committing to sustained and targeted population-specific outreach, we must also understand the extra hurdles to voting in the homeless community and the special considerations required in any effort to lessen the impact of those hurdles. In Care for the Homeless's collaboration with the Campaign Finance Board, we are effectively opening up the space for people to learn that those barriers to their participation in the political system can be removed, and that they can and should vote. Just as significantly, we are helping our homeless clients vote by bringing voter registration to them. Aptly, this approach to our voter engagement efforts mirrors the agency's central tenet of this program at large. Care for the Homeless brings care and services to our clients where they are, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Nita Burson. I am the second vice president of the Brooklyn unit of the NAACP, and I pastor our congregation in Crown East Brooklyn. I'd like to thank you for convening us this evening, and especially thank Ms. Anita Howard Mayers, who is the co-chair of our civic engagement at the NAACP. She is very steadfast in her vigilance to make sure that we make these things. The NAACP has been an advocate for voting rights for more than 100 years. Literacy tests, poll tax, now service as the new issue of this day in 17 states, voter ID. This is the new Jim Crow, designed to tear equal access at the polls. I just listened to her testimony. What would they do as the homeless? Could they afford that voter ID? Would they be excluded as newly registered voters? Are their rights abrogated? Voting rights, indeed voters' rights, are not only a citizen's responsibility in a republic like ours, but it's necessary to maintain democracy. Measures like the voter ID requirement take us back to a bad time in the history of this country. We just heard the Commissioner for Human Rights testify about seeing her grandfather vote for the first time. There is no doubt that he lived in a state where there was a $1 poll tax, as it was in my home state when I was three years old, and a literacy tax, where churches would convene people to teach them what would be required uh, if they were not literate and went, went downtown to register to vote. On Saturday, more than 25,000 persons from around the country gathered at Dagenham Shaw Plaza of the United Nations on World Human Rights Day to protest this matter of a voter ID. In fact, as Americans, in other countries who have uh, developed punitive measures toward voting, we have held strong restrictions on them. But 17 states in this country have passed this as of three weeks ago, number 17. So I urge you now in this committee to remain vigilant on this matter and not to allow other interests to influence this most basic of human rights for citizens in a republic like ours. Democracy requires it. A voter ID equals a poll tax. Thank you. Good evening to the committee. My name is Reggie Nance, and I work as the uh, director of Insight, which is the division of Innis Communications here in the city. And uh, here locally, we own Hot 97 and 98.7 KISS FM. So how does a 
media and entertainment company comes to the space. And I have to say that over the past four years, we've worked with uh, Onita Howard Myers, uh, in particular with our public affairs show, Street Soldiers on Hot 97. And this year she came to us asking if we would support the New York Youth Poet Laureate competition. And of course it made all the sense in the world that we would support it. And we did. So that's how we've come to this space. Now I want to talk a bit about um, where we're going. And at, after a very inspired meeting with Anita, I decided to do my own research. I was, uh, quite frankly, appalled by some of the numbers and statistics that she shared with us around voter registration, voter turnout, you know, particularly among young adults and other populations in the state and in New York City. And as I started to dig and I started to search, I said, okay, taking the information that I gained from Anita in my own research, I started to look at, okay, one of the challenges uh, is young, uh, young voters, 18 to 29, both registration and turnout. And in particular in that group, uh, one of the, two of the hard to reach groups are uh, young African American and uh, Hispanic males. And then the other thing is that, that I uh, looked at was like, you know, issues get people out to the polls. And I looked at those two things and I looked at our strengths as a media and entertainment company, in particular as Hot 97 and Kids FM. And I said, okay, when it comes to young adults, one of our strengths is youth and young adult mobilization and engagement. We do that very well. The second thing I looked at is um, when it comes to civic engagement in the community, we're very much entrenched in the community. I mean, quite frankly, uh, many people learn about the issues of the elections of the people running from us. And as I looked at those, I said, you know, it makes sense that we should jump into this issue full speed and straight ahead. And as a result, what we decided to do for next year is to launch a campaign called Insight Votes USA. And it'll be a civic engagement and voter registration campaign focused on two things. Youth and young adult voter registration, those youth and young adults age 86 to 29. And then the other thing is focused on bringing uh, issues to life, the issues that matter most to our listeners. The other piece of it is scale. You know, we have four million listeners who listen to us each and every single day. Beyond that, we have uh, people who visit our websites every day. We have a, a, a social network database. I see Twitter up there. I happen to see that. You know, we have over 100,000 people who follow us on Twitter, over 200,000 people who follow us on Facebook. And also, too, we have um, over 20,000 people that watch our uh, videos on YouTube. So that's the scale piece of it. And I also finally just want to leave you to let you know that we don't just want to do a nice thing. We don't just want to do a good thing. At the end of the day, we want to have been a part of creating meaningful results and meaningful impact. And to that degree, we realize you know, we're a media and entertainment company. We can reach the masses. But in order for us to, be, to do this effectively and with credibility, we need to be a part of a coalition of people. So we're building a coalition and a network of groups and organizations and companies that have the knowledge and the expertise and the experience and the best practices and the research so that we can do this effectively. And uh, with that, I just want to say that we look forward to working with this committee and all the partners here and inciting folks in New York City and getting young voters out and older voters out registered and engaged in the electoral process. And I look forward to being a part of that policy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll recommend that you uh, come and uh, sit in on our digital action local group, a private sector group of folks that include um, Google, Ford Foundation, WNYC, uh, Mobile Commons, um, and a couple others, and it's chaired by Jed Alpert from Mobile Commons. So they're actually trying to put a lot of stuff into practice. So. Well, we'd love to be a part of it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much for your support and sharing. Uh, um, our next speaker is Jennifer people who have been working on the voting issue for a very long time, uh, a group of folks, the government groups across New York City, 
um, from Nightbird, Neil Rosenstein, from the League of Women Voters, Adrian Kibbelson, from Citizens Union, Alice Kamara, and from ALDEF, Tricer Tron. Um, and I want to take this opportunity as people are assembling, as you've heard many, many times tonight, really the real powerhouse behind all of the CFEs and all the voting uh, activities and the thing that we've heard about today is Amita Kahnemeyer's and you know she really is like more energy than any person I've ever met and really focuses all, almost all her energy on getting people in New York City to vote so if that doesn't inspire you I don't know what will. <laughs> Thing, it's got to look into audits, uh, another technological thing, or statistical 
uh, and perhaps it's one of those pieces of legislation to make sure the public has confidence in results. Maryland Action on Poll Workers, another big piece, is another bill pending. We commend our colleagues uh, from Citizens Union for working with the council to push that bill, a first step towards having comp time for city workers to work at the polls. But unless the mayor gets involved, it's going to be a weak bill. Unless the mayor gets involved, you can all look at him, not only at the Board of Elections, who he loves to point to, this coming election day, and say a lot of those problems and lines of the polls uh, would do to him. I'm just it along for a try. I'll skip to the other, because I know everyone's been wondering what the other is. Um, it's ballot design, it's been mentioned before, Assembly the Kavanaugh, we cite his bill. Uh, in our testimony is a really good model for going forward. Uh, one other issue which hasn't been talked about, we talked with overvotes and to a degree, we hope a lot of this overvote problems are behind us. Uh, we think there's a just as large as a, big, a bigger problem with undervotes. The State Board of Elections turned off, they eliminated the regulations that would require those scanners to give you undervote notification. If you forgot to turn over the ballot and vote on the charter, supposed to be notified. They eliminated, they didn't even let local boards experiment with it, scared that it would lead to long lines. Uh, we think that's a shame. Another great technological project, perhaps for the committee, take a look at the ballot marking devices, which have undervote protection, but a voter uses that. Compare that in a study. Uh, compare it to census data and see exactly how many votes are lost comparing those ballot marking devices those ballot marking device mark ballots, which have equal protection, with the rest of the population. You'll put yourself on the map in terms of research as well. And we think that's also a great way for you to go. There's obviously a lot more in our testimony, but everyone's been very patient. I want to hand it over to my colleague. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to the back. Uh, uh, my name is Adrian Kibbleson. I'm a volunteer and I'm vice president of the League of Women Voters in the city of New York. And the League has been involved in voter registration and voter education for more than 90 years. When I look around, I say, well, maybe we still have some more years to go because we haven't succeeded in bringing out the type of turnout that really is necessary for a healthy democracy. Uh, before, before I go into my testimony, I want to raise something that Neil said and, and point you to it again. It's the, the ballot marking device. It, it really is a very exciting, piece of equipment in New York City that people don't know about, that people don't use, and that unfortunately poll workers don't know about either. And we have too many stories of, of disabled people going to the poll to use a ballot marking device, and the poll workers don't know how to show them how to use it. So we're going to make this a big issue, and we hope you will too, as the year goes on. But I'm going to concentrate today a little bit on, um, on voter engagement and citizen engagement because I think this is what you're interested in and I have the pleasure of serving on a panel at the WNYC program several months ago when we talked about why don't people get out to vote. And it disturbed me in a way because what I heard coming out of that panel and that discussion was that people think that by not voting they're making a statement. And we have to really turn the conversation around. The statement they're making by not voting is they're okay with the status quo. There is nothing a lackadaisical politician appreciates more than people not voting. If you don't vote, nothing will change. We can have demonstrations and we can have seminars and we can have programs, but nothing changes in a democratic society without the input of elected officials who are put in office by the people. And we have to somehow get this message across that you can't say it doesn't affect me, that you can't say it doesn't matter, that everything you do from the moment you leave your house is affected in some way by elected officials. And we go out and do a lot of voter registration in high schools. And I try that on the students, and everybody always has an answer, one answer. Maybe breathing. Breathing has nothing to do with elected officials. And I'll say, really? You want to breathe polluted air? You want to stand in front of a bus that's spewing diesel fuels? How do you think we change air pollution? How do we get changes in design of public transportation? The money is provided, and the impetus comes from elected officials. I really think we have to move that discussion. And we no longer can accept, well, it doesn't affect me, because it affects everybody. 
So that's what we sort of set out as our mission this year, to try and show people how it affects them. Uh, I can come from the point of saying it's an honor and it's a privilege to vote, but I think we are at a point where we have to tell people that it's in their own self-interest that they have to vote. And again, when I go to high schools, we'll start with all the great principles, but we always come down to the bus passes because those are knocked out of the budget every year and the city council fights to put them back in. Now, senior citizens vote in numbers uh, unlike anyone else. And they didn't start voting when they turned 65. They voted from the day they were eligible to vote, which was usually 21. And it was a habit. And it was not just a privilege, it was an obligation. I think we have to change the direction of the discussion. We live in a democratic society. We have an obligation to participate. We have an obligation to vote. And it affects every one of our lives in more ways than anybody really thinks about it. So we're going to continue doing that. We do voter registration. We work with that. We work with the campaign finance board. We're very honored and pleased to do that. We really think it's wonderful that we have city agencies that are so tuned in to this very important, very important thing that we do in our country. We monitor the board of elections. My colleague, Kate Dorman, is here. And she goes to every board of elections meeting. We participate with, with ALDEF and with NYPER and other citizens groups to support legislation that will improve voting and improve transparency in our elections. We'll work with you in any way we can, but we really hope that we try to tell people the time has come, you have to vote, your life really depends on it. And I think it's a message. We hope you'll join us in communicating. My name is Chief Sir Tran, and I'm the voting rights organizer at ALDA, which is the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. First, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to address voting barriers in Asian American states. ALDA is a 37-year-old nonpartisan organization that protects and promotes the civil rights of Asian Americans. We've monitored elections since 1988 for compliance with language assistance provisions of the Voting Rights Act and the Help America Vote Act to document incidents of anti-voter disenfranchisement. Also, every Friday, we register new voters after they are sworn in at the naturalization ceremony. Complaints we are received from, range from hostile co-workers making racist remarks towards Asian Americans and limited English proficient voters to improper or excessive demands for identification for Asian American voters. In addition, elderly Asian American voters could not read the ballots because their Asian language font sizes were too small. They were also denied language assistance they had their names missing from the voter registration list, and they were denied affidavit ballots in cases when they were entitled to them. In 2008, a Sikh voter was made to vote by traditional ballot because his last name was common, and poll workers in Ozone Park, Queens, quote, couldn't figure out which one he was, end quote. In 2006, in Flushing, Queens, a voter was asked to show her naturalization certificate in order to vote. At one poll site in Lower East Side, Manhattan, there's only one interpreter for hundreds of Chinese voters. And in 2000, also in New York, mistranslated ballots flipped the heading so that Democrats were listed as Republicans and vice versa. In October 2011, the Census Bureau announced that under Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, bilingual ballots and language assistance must be provided to Asian Indian voters in Queens, in addition to the already mandated Chinese and Korean in Queens, and Chinese in Manhattan and Brooklyn. The census does not specify which Asian Indian language it will cover, but also is meeting with many local South Asian groups to suggest and possibly um, will suggest covering Bengali, Punjabi, and Hindi languages to the Board of Elections. We're currently in the process of talking. <coughs> For many immigrants, their English language skills may limit them from fully participating in our electoral process. Imagine feeling very excited to vote for the first time, only to find out that your name is missing from the voter rolls, or not being able to read the ballot, or encountering a hostile or racist poll worker, or being denied language assistance. These experiences deter limited English proficient voters from continuing to vote in future elections. All that will be monitoring poll sites for compliance with federal and state laws and documenting any voters, any voting barriers that voters still face. We are working with local community groups and the Board of Elections to ensure that Asian Americans can fully exercise their right to vote. 
Thank you for your attention to this important issue and for the time to speak today. And I can take any questions.
library tour and uh, just really had a, a chance to get involved in, in the community and speak to, to my peers, people of the same age, some uh, at my school. And they, they continually ask, you know, I would uh, be absent from school sometimes. They continually ask, you know, what are you doing? Why are you always, why are you always out of class? And I respond, I'm, I'm speaking to, to kids just like you, trying to get them involved, trying to get them uh, registered. And, uh, and it's, it goes beyond just registering because we also want to turn out. So uh, I tried, at the time that I served, I just recently turned 18 for July, in July, this past summer. So I have yet to vote, but uh, during uh, my term, once I turned 18, I got a chance to uh, register to vote. And I'm, I'm hoping to have the people that, the kids that I spoke in front of uh, during my term, uh, hopefully they turn out alongside me and um, we have good numbers. So, thank you. Dan Cho, who's a site coordinator, who also happens to be on the staff of the Checking Fund. Pleasure. Good evening. Am I the last speaker? No, there's a couple more. Okay, good. I'll try and keep this short. Good evening, Chair, members of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board, Amy Moltres, and those following us uh, via live web stream. I'm the Director of the Candidate Services Unit for the Campaign Finance Board. But today, I'm here before the committee as a poll site coordinator. As a matter of background, after the 2010 primary election, I chose to serve as a poll site coordinator, poll site worker, specifically because of the voter issues encountered in the primary, including the new rollout of electronic voting machines. My message today, uh, hopefully, is to improve the poll workers' experience and operations, and in turn, the voters' experience. A quick recap of this year's general election at my poll site, Tweed Court, on Chamber Street, right up, right up the block. 14 assigned poll workers we had. I was the poll site coordinator. Nine showed up. We had 26 votes cast. Highlights, all poll workers I got in touch with the night before election day all showed up on time and were cordial and professional throughout the day. So it's not about the poll, poll workers. And from my recent experience with the Board of Elections, uh, they have continued to be responsive from the issues and experience throughout the 2010 elections, specifically the opening of the poll sites on time, requiring annual trainings of its workers, and providing missing information or materials the day of the poll sites and the day of the election. So four recommendations, very practical. Uh, as a candidate services unit uh, director, I try to keep everything very practical with the candidates we advise. Materials, number one, consolidate the manuals and guides and ensure they all have the same messaging. On election day, I refer to four different booklets, not including the instructions for the scanner and the ballot marking device. Why? Because I wanted to make sure proper procedures were followed and proper documentation was being placed in each of the envelopes. Two, close, close of the polls. Specifically regarding the return of Canvas, and I know everyone has spoken about this for the past year, I implore this body to recommend a portable memory device, PMD, be the first source for election day results handed off to the police officer to automatically be uploaded into their computer systems. The training I received this July, that was supposed to be the process, and then I got some last minute memos saying, let's go back to the paper return to Canvas uh, that you have to handwrite and give to the police officer. So I understand that state law requires a paper trail, as we in the public have been told many times, and that's where the return of Canvas serves as that paper documentation to support the results of the PMD. I do not understand in this day and age why the electronic device cannot serve the purpose it should. Expedite the election results. Voters do not want to stay up past 11 o'clock for the results, neither do the poll workers. Three, poll workers shift. I recommend the Board of Elections create an AM and PM shift for poll workers where they are not required to work 
a 17 to 18 hour day, unless of course they sign up for both sessions. Such flexibility would allow for more poll workers, more members of the public to participate and be engaged, and help recruit those who otherwise would not work a 17, 18 hour day, such as college students and young professionals. And lastly, partisanship. Maybe it's me, uh, however, I personally do not support nor understand the partisan nature in the administration of our city's elections. I was a registered Democrat until last year, uh, when chosen to serve as a poll site coordinator. In the meantime, I changed my party affiliation to independence, and then was asked to change it back to Democrat in order to serve as a poll site coordinator. In conclusion, it's a matter of consistency in serving the voter. What do they get out of it? So here's the big picture. In a society where we are accustomed to what's immediate and how something affects one person, we need to re-examine the incentives for voting. At a certain point in time, I heard that one-third number, every registered voter hopefully voted at least once. Where's the return on their investment? Where are the flaws in bringing them back as return customers? It's about the experience and ensuring the process of voting is seamless, enjoyable, and delivered in a competent and professional manner. Where does that start? With the Board of Elections and the poll site workers. Um, open to any questions.
we're now almost two years in. It's not been implemented. A very extremely large community, third ethnic group in New York City, is exceedingly upset and frustrated regarding this difficulty. Uh, you, you have heard the public officials, there are many others who have written letters uh, to the uh, election commission and have uh, their organizations who have offered to subsidize the cost of translation and all of this has been resoundingly ignored. So um, here, uh, Europe Act is United Russian American Public uh, Action Committee. So we are here to um, uh, say that on behalf of the community, we feel that uh, despite our best efforts, despite the best efforts of the community to speak to the Board of Elections and to have the voices heard, the, the community has been ignored. Uh, we feel it behooves us to uh, move the process to the next level, and I wanted to ask our legal counsel, uh, Ivan Kapatsky, to speak to that account. Good evening. Uh, I've been asked to be uh, essentially litigation counsel to the Russian Political Action Committee for this process. And uh, from you, we receive highly engaged officials that are ready to support us. And we are here to ask that you do that. We're also here to answer any questions that you may have because this is an issue we've had to live with for many years, unfortunately. It has uh, taken almost five years for the initial law to have been enacted. It was preceded by much deliberation, hearings, findings. At this point, the need has been vetted and clear. The law has passed. Uh, every single legislative body has agreed. Governor Patterson has signed it. And uh, that was effective uh, July 2009, as you've heard. And the law was due to be uh, really uh, uh, taking effect on January 1st, 2010. Uh, the Board of Elections in the city, which is subject to this law, has had much prior notice has resisted this law while it was still being debated, uh, has submitted you know, correspondence to the effect of it being an unfunded mandate, um, which prompted the legislators to uh, seek support from the mayor's office, which they got in writing, and in reliance on those promises from the mayor's office that funding would not be an issue, and that they believe the need is real, and that they will make sure that the voting materials are actually translated. Uh, the state passed this law. We're here. Uh, while you, many speakers here fight to register new voters, that's not the problem that we have in the Russian community. You're talking about immigrants that believe in the dream and believe in the rule of law, who sacrifice to be here, and they are showing up. They're showing up with translators, home attendants, every which way, driving each other to be there to vote. And I mean, as you've heard, there's much confusion about these new um, voting machines. And not only do they not, they, they have no instruction manual that they can understand. And when they ask for assistance, generally the poll workers deny their use of translators and helpers. Uh, I understand some of the sort of the history of this involves, you know, uh, undue pressure on somebody in the voting booth, but at the same time, having someone who can't possibly, you know, cast a vote in the voting booth by themselves doesn't serve the purpose either. Um, so uh, the statistics are such that several hundred thousand people are actually affected by what is uh, what, what this law considers. And we ask for the strongest support in this. Uh, at this point, we are preparing legal action. We've started collecting many, many uh, sort of eyewitness accounts and stories and affidavits of the, the different you know, incidents that they were involved in and how um, sort of the, the absence, uh, how the Board of Elections has uh, disenfranchised them. And if you have questions, I'm happy to entertain them.
Um, and then our last speaker of the night, one of the, you know, was a great voter for sitting in the amount of patients of to sit for this whole hearing, Brandy Black. I'm sorry, I skipped someone. I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't want to go crazy, I'm sorry. I, I skipped some. I, two people staying put together, I'm sorry, I skipped you. It's, uh, it's, uh, 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 Ina Rolovich, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped you. Good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Actually, this issue was raised by many speakers before me. I, I also represent the Russian speaking community, and I will speak again on um, what is happening. I received so many testimonies from co workers, and so it is uh, exactly what what is needed. <coughs> um, our ethnic group has a significant number of elderly people who came to the United States as refugees in advanced age, many of whom tried to study English but have not succeeded. Many of them, veterans of World War II, victims of Soviet persecution or Holocaust survivors. They are patriots of their new country and became American citizens and they would like to carry out their uh, right and responsibility to vote. However, their poor knowledge of English doesn't allow them to fully participate in the elections. There are some election districts in New York City that have a significant number of Russian-speaking citizens, up to 20% of population. A lot of them are being shut out unfairly of the voting process. These people don't vote because they are not registered, because they are unable to read materials uh, in English to do so. There were a lot of cases of despicable relationship toward, toward uh, the Russian-speaking seniors who didn't speak English at the election polling places in 2000 when a Russian-speaking person ran for a position and a supplement for the first time, and people tried to write in his name. I spoke at the city council and uh, VIC back uh, hearings about this misconduct. Because of our and the New York Immigration Coalition efforts, now we have many Russian-speaking inspectors and coordinators and even policemen at polling places. Since census 2000 indicated that Russian is the fourth spoken at home language in New York City after English, Spanish, and Chinese, we turned to the New York State elected officials with a request to provide translation of election materials into Russian also. After long struggle, finally the amendment number seven to the New York State Election Law, Chapter 244, was adopted and was signed into the law in July 2009. The law mandates the New York City Board of Elections to provide the same information in Russian that it provides in languages other than English on its website, and it must also produce and disseminate citywide a booklet that includes uh, voter registration form in English with instruction in Russian, instructions in Russian regarding the criteria and application process for obtaining the an absentee ballot, and section with general voter information in Russian, including frequently asked questions. Actually, this is not enough. We consider that an election ballot, a bedevic ballot, and annual notification of registration where date of elections and address of a foreign place is provided should also be translated in Russian. Foreign places must demonstrate a bill of voters' rights, translated not only into Spanish, Chinese, and Korean, but also into Russian. We believe that New York City, New York City Board of Elections must also provide Russian interpreters 
as the legislative districts where the Russian-speaking population constitutes over 5%. The New York State uh, Russian language law was supposed to take an effect on January 1, 2010. However, even two years later, it still hasn't worked properly. None of required election materials have been translated. No bill of the strikes translated into Russian was demonstrated at any polling place. On the uh, Board of Election website, information of poll site uh, locator, dates to remember, and the link to a new site entitled World of the New Way in New York still need translation into Russian. Too bad when the whole ethnic minority loses trust to New York State government uh, and to voting process. Uh, I received complaints from 13 election inspectors from Brooklyn and Queens. All of them wrote about necessity to have Russian interpreters indicated about election material materials translated into Russian. Uh, one is uh, point is very easy to do to have a larger font on election ballots. Um, and one more thing that is not required by the new law but very important. The voters need some information about candidates in order to make a deliberate decision for whom to vote. Before all city voters received by mail a voter city guide where they received the short information about candidates for every position and their problems, what they stand for. Now voters feel lost. They are coming to the polling place and asking for whom should I vote? Or don't come at all because they don't want to vote automatically with no knowledge about candidates. Some inspectors suggested that polling places would be, should be provided with leaflets with pictures of candidates and short information on them translated in Spanish, Chinese, Korean and Russian. Without information about candidates, voters with full command of English may be easily manipulated by people who advise them to vote for somebody. Voting is the most important act of civic participation and it cannot be taken away from a community because of poor English proficiency of its members. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say I'm very impressed by, the, uh, or by all of the advocates for the Russian community. Uh, you're representing your community very well. Yeah, actually it was um, said that the uh, Board of Election doesn't cooperate. That's true, but um, I believe that uh, Bloomberg administration should be pushed because it is really unfunded mandate and uh, the city administration has to provide funding for this translation. Some, somebody has to, to, do, to push this. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ms. Black, while you're not the last person, you are the next person. Oh, 